And I am going to introduce our speaker. Uh, it is a pleasure to welcome Emily May, uh, who is a pollinator conservation specialist with the Xerces Society's pesticide program. Emily received a master's of science in entomology from Michigan State University and has studied pollinator habitat restoration, bee nesting habits, and the effects of pest management practices on wild bee communities. Her work with Xerces since 2015 has focused on supporting crop pollinators through habitat creation and protecting bees and other beneficial insects from pesticides. Um, I just wanna mention that one thing um, that she does now uh, is to provide farmers with technical assistance when building habitat that is funded through the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and I just wanna say, I, I actually, um, you know, first, I, Emily and I didn't meet uh, back in 2015, but I did know of Emily. And um, even at that time, uh, folks talked about her amazing communication uh, and, and communication skills and, and outreach work. So um, she was well known for it then and, and still now. Thank you so much, Emily, for uh, being a part of our series tonight. You can take it away. Thank you so much for that very nice introduction. I'm very, very honored to be here. And thanks to the Massachusetts Pollinator Network, to Nofa Mass for organizing this webinar and for inviting me to speak. Um, so I'm Emily May. I'm a pollinator conservation specialist with the pesticide program at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you today about managing pests while protecting pollinators. So this talk is mainly focused on sort of a home garden setting and backyards, but if you're looking for info on farm settings, I'm happy to take questions about that at the end or to give you my contact information so that we can chat. But we'll start with some basics on pollinators and why they're important, and then get into the weeds a bit more on pesticides, the risk that pesticides can pose to pollinators, and then think about how we can prevent and monitor and respond to pest issues in our own gardens and yards while keeping pollinators in mind. So I'm looking forward to taking questions at the end of this presentation. And hopefully this will be, I haven't timed it, but I'm hoping it'll be about the 45 minute range. Oh, I know that acknowledgements usually go at the end of presentations, but I did want to put it up front to give a special thanks to the Xerces Society members and other supporters that make our work possible. We're a member supported organization and this support allows us to continue doing on the ground conservation work and educational presentations like this one. If you aren't familiar with the Xerces Society, we've been around since 1971. This is actually our um, 50th year anniversary working to protect wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. Our name is a reference to the Xerces blue butterfly, which is believed to be the first American butterfly to go extinct due to human development. It previously lived in the coastal sand dunes around San Francisco. Xerces has a variety of staff across the country doing on the ground conservation work. We have programs in pollinators and agricultural biodiversity endangered species, pesticides, and a relatively new community engagement program focused on urban communities. But perhaps some of the most helpful work we've done over the last 50 years is writing a whole library of science-based guidance for protecting pollinators and other invertebrates. So if you visit our website at xerces.org, um, we have a ton of free national and regional resources on plants and pollinators and other invertebrates. So this is a library of decades of work. And um, if there's something missing from it, please get in touch with me if you can't find the answer to a question that you have about any of the above. But today I'm, I'm here to talk to you about just one of those many ecosystem functions that uh, invertebrates provide, which is pollination. And this section is, is going to be review. I'm going to try and just get it out of the way quickly, but I wanted to get us all on the same page to think about why we want to protect pollinators when we're managing pests and um, doing other things to manage the land around us. So and pollination is a really important part of our ecosystems and our managed world. More than 85% of flowering plants require an animal, chiefly among those insects and chiefly among insects, bees, to move pollen around from flower to flower to be able to produce seeds and nuts and fruit. So having a diverse pollinator community is essential for sustaining natural areas and all the wild plants that need pollination, and then also productive agricultural lands and the many crops that um, require pollination to produce seeds and fruit. 
This pollination service is really important for natural systems that pollinators allow wildflowering plants to reproduce, to continue to reseed into their environments. The seeds and fruits that those flowering plants produce are also food sources for many other types, types of wildlife, from birds to mammals. And through that simple act of moving pollen from flower to flower, pollinators are building out the base of the food chain for a lot of different species. And some pollinators are also part of that food chain themselves. About nine in 10 bird species eat insects at some point in their lives. And caterpillars or larval butterflies and moths are a really important food source for a lot of birds, especially when feeding their young. Uh, and some birds will also occasionally eat bees, either in their larval or adult form. So insects are this really just tremendous source of protein. Pollinators are also important for human diets. And since Thanksgiving is next week, I thought I would take a moment to thank some of the bees responsible for the foods that will hopefully be on some of our tables next week. Different food crops rely on different pollinators in, in many, a cup, sort of on a spectrum. There are foods that require a pollinator to set fruit. So pumpkins and squash would be an example of this. If a pumpkin flower doesn't get pollinated, it's not likely to produce a fruit. So we can thank the humble efforts of squash bees, which are our pumpkin and melon and um, squash specialist bees, as well as bumblebees and honeybees for pumpkin pies. Cranberries are also an example of a, a crop that's dependent on pollinators to be able to set fruit. Bumblebees are particularly important pollinators of cranberries, so you can thank bumblebees for that cranberry sauce on the table. But as I said, different food crops rely on pollinators in different ways. So for some crops, pollinators aren't needed for setting a fruit, but they are needed in order to be able to produce those seeds for the next year's crop or for breeding new varieties for better yields or disease resistance. So this includes a lot of the other foods that we might see in a fall harvest meal, like onions and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and carrots and sweet potatoes. So lots of different food crops rely on pollinators to some extent. And who's responsible for this essential service? There are lots of different types of animals that visit flowers, usually for that sweet reward of nectar, and then end up, end up pollinating those plants. There's a, a really diversity of, of pollinators that provide that effective and sustainable pollination. But among those, bees are our most important pollinators. We have a really amazing diversity of native bees in the United States. So there are more than 350 species, I think close to 400 in Massachusetts, and more than 10 times that number across the whole country. Um, you know, upwards of 5,000 species across North America, ranging in size from really big carpenter bees that get into your shed to tiny bees around the size of a freckle. Many of them don't look like what well, what you might picture when you think about a bee. So you might picture, you know yellow and black stripes, but there are bees that like that metallic green sweat bee in the bottom center right um, that are all around us and um, pollinating plants all around us. So why are bees so important? And it's in part because unlike a lot of the things that were on that last slide, bees are actively collecting and transporting pollen back to their nests to feed their young. So they have all kinds of specialized body features for collecting pollen, and they're really efficient at it. If you look at the bee that's up on the top left, uh, that's a small sweat bee that has pollen packed in under the top of her hind legs. The bee underneath her um, is a leaf cutter bee. They, um, they're called that because they line their nests with little bit cut up pieces of leaves and they have uh, pollen collecting hairs under their abdomen. So they'll just belly flop onto a flower and rummage around and just get a ton of pollen. They're really efficient pollinators of, of open flowers like apples. So another reason that bees are, are great pollinators is they're just very efficient at handling flowers. Um, female bees are just really go-getters. They don't want to waste time. So once they've learned how to extract pollen from a particular kind of flower, they'll go back to that same flower and very efficiently collect pollen and move it around from uh, flower to flower on that species. So that behavior is really great for providing pollination to that species. The, the European honeybee, which is often what comes to mind when people think about bees, is not a native species in the Americas. It's different from, all, from many of the, the native bees here. Honeybees are social bees with a caste system. They have a queen and workers and drones. 
and they're perennial. They live through the winter, feeding off of honey stores rather than, you know, most of our native bees are annual. They're living on an annual cycle um, where they're not going through the winter in the same way that a honeybee colony would. Managed hives of the European honeybee take credit for a lot of the large scale agricultural crop pollination in the US, but there is trouble in relying on a single pollinator as we know from the many problems that are facing honeybees. Um, they're challenged by parasites and pathogens, diseases and pesticides among them in poor nutrition. But uh, because they are a managed species, they're domesticated species, this species is not uh, on the verge of extinction. And there are a lot of native bees, wild bees that are unmanaged living around us that are um, in more trouble than the honeybee. Most of those 3,600 species of native bees in the US are quite different from the honeybee. The vast majority live below ground with only really tiny inconspicuous holes that give any sign that they're there. And the other third live above ground in tunnels, um, in old snags and in pithy plant stems. So on the, on the right there is a serotina bee. It's a small carpenter bee that's in a blueberry cane. And you'll, you'll see them, I have them in my bee balm stems in my yard. Um, so these are just like really tiny little bees that live above ground in plant stems. And then a, a small fraction of our native bees, the bumblebees, are probably the closest to the honeybee in, in sort of how they live, but they form small colonies in hollow cavities, usually something like an old rodent hole, um, could be above ground or below ground. So with these, I mean, you know where your human neighbors live, I hope. They probably live above ground in some kind of obvious wooden structure. Um, and if they live below ground, then you probably have better stories than I do. But bees are living in less obvious places around us. These nesting spaces in the soil and plant stems and in wood are where bees are living around our homes and gardens and farms. And so we think when we think about how we're managing those spaces, it's important to be looking out for all of these not obvious neighbors that we have around us. So what can we do to build spaces for pollinators to thrive? There are three basic habitat requirements that we're always talking about that are the same in all spaces from urban places to farms and ranches. And where we find opportunities for protecting and improving and building these habitat needs into our landscapes, it might differ a bit among, you know, an urban park to a farm. But in the end, what all bees are going to need is food, shelter, and refuge from pesticides. So food is nectar and pollen, um, the things that bees are going to be bringing back to their nests. Um, for butterflies, it would be host plants. So the things that they're developing larvae are going to eat through the course of their lives. And then shelter is the undisturbed areas to nest in the ground or in plant stems. Um, and then for, for butterflies, again, it would be sort of an overwintering site. They're not creating a nest, but they are um, overwintering. You know, that's why we tell people to leave the leaves. So that, that is the base of the pyramid for pollinator protection. You need healthy habitat. And to keep it healthy, you need to protect that habitat from pesticides. So for the sake of time for this presentation, I'm gonna assume that you are already into pollinators, that you already know a few things about planting native plants, um, providing a diversity of plants that bloom throughout the growing season. And if not, there's lots of resources available out there, um, webinars on YouTube, resources on our website, et cetera. I'm also happy to take questions about that, but I figure I should probably um, dive right into the managing pests uh, while protecting pollinators part of this talk. So first, to be able to do that, we need to talk about what a pest is. What do we consider a pest? Uh, pests might be competitors with humans for resources. So it could be something like a moth that defoliates forest trees um, or a weed species that's out competing our food crops. Um, we also might consider pests to be some kind of enemy, like the, the disease transmitting insects um, or rats or mosquitoes, ticks that carry disease that affects humans. And then there's kind of basically nuisance organisms, like things we don't really like, but don't cause real harm or damage to us. Something like ants in a picnic shelter or dandelions in a yard. So it's a real spectrum of what we might consider to be a pest. And some of these things might need management and then others might not. One thing to keep in mind is that the vast majority of insect species 
are either directly beneficial to humans or otherwise somehow foundational in ecosystems. So things like um, things that might be considered pests in one environment are actually the base of the food chain in others. And if you look across all of the described insect species, only a small fraction are actually uh, occasional pests, whether that's in food crops or in structures and, and things like that. But most of the chemicals that we use nowadays kill, uh, they're harmful to more than just their tar target species. Um, and that's what I'll talk about a little bit more. So when I, when I use the word pesticide, um, it's an umbrella term that includes, but is not limited to, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, um, rodenticides, even antimicrobials like Lysol are technically pesticides. The term pesticides is often sort of misused as synonymous with insecticides, but when I use it, I'm, I'm trying to use it in the broader sense of anything that could be used to um, treat a pest, to manage a pest. So the pesticides that we're most concerned about in relation to pollinators are insecticides, fungicides, and to some extent, herbicides. Um, and one reason that we're particularly concerned about pesticide use is that the federal process to evaluate pesticides doesn't adequately consider impacts on native bees. So if you want a deeper dive on that, there's uh, Sharon Salvaggio at Xerces did a great presentation going into sort of the, the some of the real gaps in the regulatory process. And that's on the Xerces YouTube channel if you're, if you're interested in getting really into the weeds on ecotoxicology. When we think about pesticides, we're often thinking about crops and agricultural spaces, but they are commonly used in our urban landscapes as well, often for cosmetic reasons. And actually more pesticides are used per acre in urban spaces than in many agricultural areas. In our communities, they're often used for these cosmetic reasons to maintain really manicured landscapes that they can wash off from grass and patios and impervious surfaces and end up in our waterways. So a lot of rivers in agricultural and urban areas contain pesticides at levels that, are, that could be considered risky to aquatic life. Let's think about pollinators. This isn't a talk about aquatic invertebrates. In order to protect pollinators from pesticides, we have to think about how they might be exposed to them. There are various exposure pathways depending on the pesticide and how it's applied, but um, something is they range from something as simple as a bee on a flower that's being sprayed or be sort of becoming directly contacted with the pesticide to things that are more indirect whether that's visiting a plant that's been treated previously or bringing back part of that plant to its nest and lining its nest with leaves that are contaminated with pesticides um, having a pesticide applied to the soil that then contaminates nesting sites for bees that are living underground. Um, and then also there are a lot of systemic insecticides as well as um, most fungicides and herbicides are systemic. So they might come into contact with something that was applied elsewhere and has moved into a plant and into its pollen and nectar. So um, life cycle and behavior and the way that bees interact with plants um, and the way that you know, butterflies are interacting with plants and having their larvae eat foliage. These are all really important to consider when you're thinking about how something might come into contact with a pesticide. In our home spaces, um, in our urban spaces, there are some sort of less obvious areas where exposures could occur. So maybe you had, for example, a tree that was struggling with some kind of pest. So you called a tree doctor, an arborist, that person injected or otherwise treated the tree for the pest or disease. And some of these systemics can last a really long time in woody plants. So that persistence you know, is, is linked with applications that are designed to have the pesticide taken up into the plant. So basil bark or soil drench or trunk injection of a pesticide. And blooms and leaves from those plants that were treated can be contaminated with toxic levels. Um, in this case, I'm thinking about neonicotinoids, which are um, a class of systemic insecticides that you've probably heard about. Um, those can be contaminated with toxic levels of neonics the following year after application. So they are very persistent once they are protected from the sun and injected into a woody plant 
There are also foundation treatments around homes used for things like termites and carpenter ants, and those are also systemic uh, water soluble in insecticides, and they can be quite persistent. So plants that are placed in or around that foundation treatment could become contaminated. So we, we recently did some milkweed sampling um, that just got published as a, as a research study to see what types of pesticides were present in different types of sites on, in milkweeds. And at one home where pesticides hadn't been applied for at least six years, the year that they moved into that home, the milkweed was contaminated with concerning levels of an insecticide that had been used to manage structural pest the year before they moved into the home. So six years after application, milkweeds that planted around that home were still expressing concerning levels of insecticides. So that is a, a very persistent place and, and pollinator attractive plants that are around the foundation of a home could be a source of pesticide exposure um, if those homes were treated for, for structural pests like termites or carpenter ants. Something to keep in mind when we're trying to protect the pollinators in our yard and, and do the best that we can to conserve bees and butterflies in our yards. All right, so this the next few slides are going to get a little bit into the weeds, but I hope you'll stay with me. Um, so all of all those exposure routes that I've just talked about, they're important to keep in mind thinking about risk. And when I say risk, I, I have kind of a specific meaning in mind. So there's two factors that generate the risk of a pesticide um, to pollinators, whether and also to humans, you know, so any any kind of risk. The basic equation is toxicity on the one side, the capacity of a pesticide to cause harm. How toxic is it and in what way? And then the other piece of the risk equation is exposure, which is what we just talked about. How much of the pesticide was the pollinator exposed to? Was it exposed on the outside of its body? Did it eat it um, in the leaves of its host plant? How long was the exposure for? Was it one time pest, uh, you know, pesticide application? Or was it, in the case of a butterfly, um, continuously exposed to it and its food? So all this sort of boils down to risk is uh, the dose makes the poison. A highly toxic pesticide that a pollinator is exposed to just a little bit might be less risky than a less toxic pesticide that a pollinator would be constantly exposed to. Um, and so this helps us start to think about how we might reduce risk to pollinators. It might mean choosing a, a different, less toxic pesticide to use for managing a specific pest, or it might mean figuring out ways to protect habitat from exposure. Um, so we've talked about the exposure piece. Let's talk a little bit about toxicity. Uh, I hope you'll again, stay with me. This is important for how pesticides get categorized as highly toxic or practically non-toxic to bees, but it's really a, a flawed process. So before a pesticide can be registered with the EPA, pesticide manufacturers are, are required to submit the results of a variety of different tests, looking at toxicity to birds, mammals, fish, and insects, depending on sort of the use patterns that are expected for that chemical. And the way that EPA assesses toxicity for bees is based on really basic lab testing of adult honeybees. So in that test, uh, a pesticide is applied at different doses to the top of the thorax, the back of the honeybee, just like sort of this silly picture that I made. <laughs> um, but they, they look for the dose that kills half of the tested group of adult honeybees over 48 hours. The smaller the dose, the more toxic that pesticide is to bees. This is called the lethal dose or the dose that kills 50% of a test population of honeybees. And then the EPA assigns pesticides into three really crude toxicity groups, highly toxic, moderately toxic, and practically non-toxic based on the LD50. Um, <clears throat> So practically non-toxic is kind of a misnomer. There's many, many pesticides in this practically non-toxic category that have toxicity to bees and other beneficials that isn't captured by this standard test. Honeybees stand in for all other bees in these tests and other terrestrial insects. So if you're remembering our great diversity of native bees, they aren't always well represented by honeybees in these toxicity tests and might be more or less sensitive than honeybees to different pesticides. So EPA's groupings are a really crude tool for classifying, classifying how toxic a pesticide is. Um, and toxicity is really a spectrum. Um, so there are some 
pesticides that fall right on the cusp between those groupings. And others have toxicity that isn't very well captured by the testing. So how are pesticides toxic to insects specifically? And I promise I will get into pest management shortly. I just wanna give us all the sort of background information we need to be on the same page. So insecticides are designed to kill insects. There are lots of different ways that a chemical might harm an insect. A pesticide's mode of action is what we use to, um, to describe the specific way or the specific mechanism by which a pesticide causes harm. The most common modes of action for insecticides are those that affect the insect's nervous system. So there are basically many ways to achieve the same effect, which is overstimulation of the nervous system, leading to paralysis and death. Some of the insecticides that act on the nervous system are some really common classes of insecticides, organophosphates, pyrethroids, neonicotinoids. But another group that I, I wanted to point out is insect growth regulators. So these are insecticides that affect insect growth and development, and they're primarily toxic to developing insects that haven't reached maturity. So some of them are mimicking a hormone that causes insects to molt prematurely. Um, others affect the insect's ability to develop its exoskeleton. So anyway, they can die quite an ugly death. So the, uh, the, the images on the right show molting abnormalities that are caused by exposure to insect growth regulators. On the top is a milkweed bug, um, and on the bottom is a cabbage white butterfly. So the, the normal one is on the bottom, and then the IGR, the insect growth regulator exposed butterfly pupa is, is above that. So this is where you can start to see how that risk assessment, that standardized testing can be complicated and kind of problematic. Um, standardized toxicity testing is performed on adult honeybees. Would you expect a fully mature adult honeybee to be affected by something meant to affect growth and development? You wouldn't, but you might have an, uh, you might expect an insect growth regulator to affect developing brood. <coughs> but those impacts wouldn't be reflected in how EPA classifies the toxicity of, of something to bees. Um, they're often, these, these pesticides are often classified as reduced risk because they have low toxicity to adult honeybees as captured by that standard test. But that doesn't mean they wouldn't be harmful if a developing larva were exposed to them. So we have to account for some of these impacts when we're working to protect pollinators from harm, as some of them are sort of falling through the cracks in this regulatory system and risk assessment process. And one thing I did want to touch on, since this is an organic farming association, organic standards are a really strong and valuable system that we at Circe's strongly support. But we do need to be aware that just because a pesticide is organic doesn't mean that it's non-toxic or doesn't pre present some risks to pollinators. So I, I often hear things like, oh, I'm just using neem oil. Well, neem oil and its active component, which is azadiractin, these are insect growth regulators, and those can have impacts on developing larvae. It is organic. Is it safe for insect larvae? Probably not. We should be, you know, keeping neem oil off of our butterfly house, host plants, for example. Uh, another example similar to that is Bt, which is a common organic pesticide. Uh, it's a soil bacterium that produces these crystalline proteins that poke holes in insect stomachs, and different strains of Bt. Uh, are specific to certain groups of insects. So the most common one is uh, a strain that targets Lepidoptera or butterflies and moths. <clears throat> it's used for things like cabbage looper, fruit worms, and it's practically non-toxic to bees because it's specific to butterflies and moths. But it's is it safe? Not for butterflies. <clears throat> Excuse me. This doesn't mean that organic pest management is on par with conventional pest management by any means. Most organic pesticides, with the exception of things like copper, are a lot less stable than their synthetic counterparts, and they break down more quickly when they're exposed to air and light. Um, and I can, I can give examples of that down the road, but I should probably keep moving. Um, the last thing I'd like to talk, touch on here in terms of risks, uh, and then we'll move on to sort of using project preventive strategies and such, is that just because an, inf uh, an ingredient is familiar uh, and present in your kitchen doesn't make it safe, especially in mixtures. So again, looking at sort of online garden forums, I see recommendations for variations on a vinegar, dish soap, Epsom salt type mix in a lot of, for a lot of different purposes. And all of these are familiar items in our households. 
but the dose makes the poison. And this mixture can be kind of concerning for use around, you know, butterfly host, host plants or even for general home garden use. Just as an example, this soap is something that can uh, affect a lot of things that it comes into contact with. And so using a dish soap spray on your plants to kill an insect or fungus can also break down the plant's natural uh, oils and waxes on their leaves and make them more vulnerable to other kinds of infections. So weakening that plant might, might make it more vulnerable down the road. And I've, I've seen lots of things online um, that are concerning. <laughs> uh, one that I just had to put in here because it made me laugh, but also tear out my hair was um, someone who had tried a whole bunch of different things and then decided that uh, defeated that uh, they would also um, <laughs> try using uh, their own fungicide created from a foot fungus cream, which I've seen a lot of things wrong on here, but I can promise you that you won't have the results that you want trying to control powdery mildew with your foot foot fungus cream. Um, so what I'm just trying to say is that something that you consider safe for your own use might not be safe for a pollinator or your plants. Um, and some of these homemade mixes can create new problems in your garden instead of solving old ones. So let's get into the part that you might be more excited about, um, which is addressing pesticides in yards and gardens. So protecting pollinators from pesticides isn't just about making sure that a pesticide product is, is you know, least toxic, doesn't have a warning sign about bees. Um, there's a lot of prevention that can um, go into place before considering pesticides. And especially in yards and gardens, we'd like to see um, elimination of pesticide use that is in response to cosmetic concerns rather than to the health of a plant or the loss of a crop. Um, a lot of times these types of cosmetic issues can be avoided in the first place by choosing the right plant for the right place and by providing habitat for beneficial insects to keep pests at manageable levels. A set of principles that can help um, think through pest management decisions comes from a prevention first perspective and that's integrated pest management, which might be pretty familiar to some of you, but others, maybe it's not the uh, something you're familiar with. So I figured I'd take a couple slides to talk about it. Integrated pest management is, is basically a framework that can be applied in all different kinds of settings, um, in, wherever there might be a pest that needs some kind of management. So let's go through the steps. The first step is knowledge. It's a knowledge of the pest that you have and their biology. This is really important. You might be kind of seeing damage from a, uh, a pest on a particular plant that you don't know what's causing it. So how can you sort of work to correct or prevent that damage if you don't know what it is? Step two is um, prevention. So knowing that a certain pest, once you've identified it, is present, you can make decisions about how to break their life cycles through all kinds of preventive measures, which is that first line of defense. Um, and then moving on, when your crops and, and backyard plants are already in the ground and there are a few preventive steps remaining, this step is really about observing and monitoring pest populations, determining when to intervene, when those populations have gotten out of hand. Um, on farms, this is typically some kind of an economic threshold where pest damage starts to result in crop yield losses. Um, that's, that's not really the case in home gardens and I'll talk more about when to intervene. Um, but, but step four is that intervention. So when monitoring tells you, okay, this plant's health is really threatened or my crop yield is really threatened, um, that's when you might intervene. And the key part of, of sort of using thresholds or doing this observation and monitoring is actually what happens before that, that threshold is met. It encourages you to know what's happening in your garden and tolerate some damage um, where you know, you might otherwise have just wanted to intervene. If you really understand what pests you have and what their life cycles are, you can maybe take a step back and say, okay, I have time to figure this out and maybe I don't need to intervene. And then, and then step five is kind of the evaluation and planning for next year. What, what worked, what didn't work? What am I gonna think about um, for my garden for next year? What am I gonna do differently? So this is how things get refined over time. So that, that framework can be applied in all different kinds of places, but this is, this is kind of the hierarchy of intervention. Um, 
prevention being the first step, and then um, integrating a variety of cultural, mechanical, and biological controls as the intervention to help um, you know, figure out how to manage those pests. With chemical control at the very top of the pyramid is the last result. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure my mother actually ever said this, but maybe yours did. An ounce of prevention saves a pound of cure. So I'll, I'll talk about some examples of preventive strategies that we can use to build resilient um, gardens and avoid the chance that we're going to ever have to use chemical control to manage pests. So the bottom of that pyramid is the good foundation. Building a resilient ecosystem starts with good planning and design, choosing the right plant for the local conditions, building healthy soils, increasing uh, plant and beneficial insect diversity, and spacing plants out so that they're receiving good sunlight and airflow and nutrients. Don't crowd your plants too much. Diverse plantings tend to be more resilient to damages, uh, to damage and stressors. Um, again, reflecting back on what is a pest, most insects are beneficial in some way. Um, so the steps that you know that you've gone through to create some pollinator habitat will help you hopefully create a more resilient ecosystem that is less likely to attract pests, or when they do attract pests, have beneficial insects there to counteract that. Um, so if you're seeing damage on your plants, sometimes that can be a good thing. It means insects are actually using that habitat that you've created. Something is eating your milkweeds, look closely, awesome. Hopefully it's monarch caterpillars. So it, it means that insects are there and they're using that habitat. Many of those insects that eat or parasitize pests are gonna be using that diverse habitat you plant. Attracting species that prey on pests is called conservation biocontrol. So learning to identify a few of the common pests and beneficials for your uh, in your gardens can be really helpful because it can help, uh, help you recognize and promote these natural enemy species, many of which have very similar ha habitat needs to pollinators. Some of the common ones that you might find in your yard include assassin bugs, minute pirate bugs, lace wings, predatory wasps, spiders, ground beetles, um, lady beetles. So there's, there's lots of good pocket ID resources out there for beneficial insects, and it might be a good opportunity for you to kind of get out there and, and figure out what's happening in your garden. So in a garden setting specifically, um, I'm just going to spend a couple slides uh, more on the foundation for preventive management. So preventing pests and diseases from getting out of balance in the first place. So whether you're planting tree fruit or vegetables, perennial wildflowers, try to choose species or varieties that are suited for your conditions. Um, in the garden, that could mean choosing vegetable varieties that are resistant to or tolerant of certain pathogens. So tomatoes are an example of something that's uh, susceptible to a variety of different pathogens, like late blight and early blight. And if there's been an, if there's been issues with that in your garden, the best way to manage that going forward, uh, other than crop rotation, is to find and plant varieties that are resistant to some of those issues, which is usually advertised in your seed catalog. In perennial plants, there are sometimes horticultural varieties that are more resistant to plant diseases, but planning out a resilient wildflower planting is more about choosing the species rather than the varieties that are tolerant of conditions in your yard. If, you're, if your area or your yard is really dry or prone to, to summer drought, plant species that are native to your area that are drought tolerant and can do well without much water. Um, prevention is also about building the soil, making sure you have good drainage, adding organic matter, uh, checking nutrient levels and pH. So wildflowers are, for an example, uh, tend to do best in well-drained soils with a pH of five and a half to seven. So you can take a soil sample and send it in for testing um, and learn a lot from that just soil test. And then one thing that we often get wrong in preventive management is around watering. So you wanna water wisely, right? Not too little, not too much. The best option uh, for garden watering is, is soaker hoses or drip irrigation, not those overhead sprinklers that go back and forth, which tend to water just very shallowly the top part of the garden and promote shallow root growth. What you want to promote, promote is that deep root growth um, so that your plants can withstand heat and drought stress later on in the season. So you've planted appropriate species, you're building healthy soils, you're watering wisely. The next step is uh, active prevention. 
So using things like physical barriers and mulches to exclude insect pests and weeds. Um, many of you might compost yard waste and other materials. So if you're composting, you wanna make sure that your compost is reaching high enough temperatures to actually kill off pathogens. Um, this usually can't, can't be accomplished without some active management of your compost pile, turning and recharging the, the pile with fresh carbon and nitrogen and water and air to make it reach those temperatures. Other things, at least that are manageable in a backyard garden, are pruning trees and shrubs in the spring to inflow to improve airflow um, and to take out and in, you know infested vegetation throughout the season. Um, and then you might think about using trap crops to attract and manage insects that could otherwise become pests on various crops. So, for example, planting lovage on either side of your tomatoes to attract tomato hornworm, hornworms before they get into the tomatoes. So using trap crops isn't one size fits all as each crop uh, attracts a very specific set of pests, but they can fit into a home garden setting. So. Those could, yeah, border plantings, intercrops, container gardens, almost anyone could take advantage of some kind of trap crop, depending on what your, your pests, insects are. But problems do arise even in the most well-planned, resilient gardens. So and when you put so much care and elbow grease and resources into building a productive space, it can be frustrating to see your plants suffering from some kind of insect or, or disease. So, how do you intervene and how do you know when to? So the first step here is going back to um, IPM, knowing what you have. What do you have? What are you dealing with? Um, are you seeing insects, plant damage, or other symptoms? Sometimes the obvious issue is plant damage and you don't see any insects on the plant. So what you can do is look really closely in and around the plant. Do you see evidence of insects having been there? like insect frost, insect poop, fine webbing or mining trails in the leaves. What kind of, of symptoms are you seeing on leaves and flowers? Are you seeing holes that are cut all the way through or sort of a skeletonizing of tissue between um, leaf veins or dieback? So these days a smartphone can be really useful in terms of gardening tool. What you're gonna to wanna to do is take good photos, take notes of um, the symptoms that you're observing and when they started to develop. Um, how many insects are present, the extent of the damage, and all of these observations are going to help you in identifying and choosing how to manage that issue that comes up. So I'm going to give you an example from my own yard. So one of the most fulfilling aspects of being able to work from home is watching flowers in my yard blossom and buzz with all kinds of activity. But as I'm, as I'm cataloging all the different things visiting my flowers, I also notice when things start to look weird. Um, so I, I have some purple cone flower and some bee balm in the yard, um, and I spotted kind of deformed heads on both of them. Um, the, the, the bee balm was having trouble flowering the first couple of years I planted it, um, and I couldn't figure out what was going on. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you an example of kind of how I walked through that and made decisions. So the first step is really knowing what you have before you make any decisions. So, you know, just because something is eating your plants doesn't mean it's harmful. It could be beneficial in some way because you have to have caterpillars to have butterflies and moths. And I, I just wanted to know what's going on. So looking closely uh, at these flowers and pulling them apart, I could see that there was dark webbing and, and frass embedded between the, the parts of the, the purple cone flower which indicated that was probably an insect pest. And I couldn't see it at first, but after I pulled a couple of them apart, I finally found this brown and tan striped caterpillar at work. And similarly on the bee balm, I'll go back, there was, uh, there was frass present on the heads of the flowers. So I did know it was an insect, but I wasn't seeing the culprit itself directly. So how did I figure out what it was? Not everybody is or knows an entomologist. It sure does come in handy sometimes, but there are resources to help with identifying insects and plant diseases. So a quick internet search with a description of the insect and damage can be a good start, but I would be cautious about over-interpreting based on your search results. So for better and more personalized info, you can get in touch with your local cooperative extension your master gardener hotline um, or, or a state diagnostic laboratory. Those can offer you know, more expert advice that's, that's local. 
Um, and there are other options online like bugguide.net, which is a great online resource for insect identification um, and, and social media. But I would be cautious about identifications and advice that you receive from land care and pest control companies because they have an incentive to sell products and services associated with that advice. In my case, I was able to identify both of those caterpillars on my purple cone flower and bee balm through internet searches that match the description of the damage and the caterpillars that I'd found. So I had sunflower moth caterpillars on the, feeding on the pollen and immature seeds of the purple cone flower, and then I had horse mint caterpillars on my bee balm. So I'll talk a little bit more about um, what I did with that information in a, in a second. But just wanting you to know that these are tools that you can use to take these steps on your own. So once you know something is going awry in your garden, go back to the resilience and planning at the start, making sure that your plants have what they need to thrive, water, nutrients, the right soil pH, airflow. Um, and, and stressed plants look a lot worse and have a difficult time mustering defenses against infection or infestation. Um, and, and you do want to just make sure that you know what you have. So blossom end rot in tomatoes can resemble a fungal disease. So that's the second picture here, but it's actually the result of calcium deficiency in the plant. So again, it comes back to getting a good idea on what you're dealing with. All right, and I'm, I'm getting close to wrapped up here. I know we're running, at, running low on time, but um, the, the key thing here is deciding of your, on, based on your own goals, what level of damage are you willing to tolerate? Um, and, and what are your garden goals to, um, to think about when you're deciding how and when to intervene? Are you trying to conserve insects? Are you growing food to eat or for profit? So thinking about my own yard, I'm, I'm trying to conserve you know, the diversity of insects and birds and other wildlife. I'm trying to create a be beautiful space that I can enjoy with my coffee. And I'm trying to manage my land with as little effort as possible. Yes, I'm, I am a lazy gardener. <laughs> so by keeping all of those goals front and center, it's easier for me to accept some chaos in the garden and let go of imperfections and nibbled leaves, knowing that that is serving as habitat for the things around me. But I still sometimes intervene with non-chemical methods when something is really out of balance or the damage threatened survival of the plant. Um, so I ignored the sunflower moth caterpillars on my purple cone flower, but in the case of the bee balm, the caterpillars were eating the flower buds before they could even turn into flowers. So they, they were not providing that nectar and pollen resource to anything else in the yard. Um, so I did want to interrupt that life cycle to reduce the damage I was seeing on my on my bee balm because those are important contributors to the overall quality of my yard for pollinators. So what I what I went for was to try and reduce the food and shelter for the horsemen caterpillars by plucking off flower heads that showed frass from caterpillars and leaving only flower heads that didn't show signs of infestations. So I bagged and bagged up and threw off the infested flower heads on a farm that would be what we would call sanitation. So it's the same principle, but on a smaller scale. Um, but so that that goal was to just reduce the population to a point where plants could produce flowers again, which it did. So that worked out. So again, after you know what you're dealing with and you've decided decided you want to intervene, the first line of defense in a system that's putting pollinators first is this cultural management, non-chemical methods. So for that bee balm, I could pluck off flower heads that had sign of an intestation and bag them up. Um, I didn't treat the plants, I didn't clip off every flower, just enough to reduce that pest population. So for many diseases and, and certain larval infestations, that removal of infested plant material, sanitation, is a really top choice for reducing the level of damage and breaking the development cycle of a pest. Um, so the, the photo above is of leaf miners in uh, the spinach in my garden. So a few rounds again of hand picking of these leaves and they, this was back under control in my garden. Um, hand picking can be really tedious. I've spent a lot of late nights picking slugs out of lettuce, but it's deliberate and it's cautious and it does save other wildlife in the garden from harm. Um, and sometimes even just knocking, knocking insects off with water can be a good first step for non-chemical methods. So I talked a lot about pesticide risks and those pesticides that are designed to control insects 
are really distinguishing between um, beneficial insects and those that cause harm. So, but if pesticides, you know, are part of your management system, um, sometimes that's, you know, maybe you have a prized plant that you can't imagine letting go of, like your grandmother's rose bush or your mother's raspberry canes, and it's being threatened by some kind of insect outbreak or disease. And when you've already taken preventive steps to deal with that pest, um, where we're just seeking, you know, if you do, if you are using pesticides, we're asking that you are seeking out information on the toxicity of the product um, and keeping in mind that there is a lot of deceptive marketing out there with regards to toxicity to pollinators. So I'm happy to share resources if you're interested in how you can go and, and check out the toxicity of different pesticides to pollinators, um, if that's something that you're interested in. But you can also find all of, all of that information and links to it at our website. So we're looking to only use pesticides as a last resort and use it when a pest threatens the survival of a plant and not how that plant looks. Um, when we have that, when pesticides are used, thinking back to that risk equation of toxicity and exposure, we're looking to avoid use of highly toxic pesticides and high exposure scenarios. Um, so that would be, you know, thinking about treating only the area needed. So something like a spot spray or other really limited area treatment um, and making sure in all cases that we're not applying pesticides to flowering habitat or allowing them to drift onto flowering habitat, taking all possible steps to minimize that movement of pesticide from where it's applied um, into nearby habitat. You can't always control what your neighbors are doing there. So if you have a very lovely pollinator habitat and um, your neighbor is, you know, applying pesticides next door and, you know, physical distance just isn't an option in that case. So that's where um, there are other ways that, that we can work to limit harm to our pollinator habitat with things like a drift barrier to prevent contamination of your pollinator habitat in your yard. So something like um, uh, a hedge consisting of conifers, of non-flowering woody plants to capture pesticide movement from your neighbor and protect um, pollinator plantings. In other cases, it could be also deep-rooted, you know, native bunch grasses and that kind of thing to try and account for that below ground movement of, um, of pesticides from your neighbor's yard into yours. So these drift kind of capture plantings should be planted with things that aren't really attractive to pollinators, but they can help protect flowering habitat that's further in and away from the, the cropland. So I'll just end here by saying at the end of the day, the best thing that we could do to manage landscapes for pollinators is to increase habitat, plant lots of flowers, leave undisturbed nesting areas, and then do what we can to protect that habitat from pesticides. If you build it, pollinators will come and they will thrive in, in your resilient, diverse ecosystem that you've created around your yard. If you're interested in digging in more for some, some more detail on anything that I've talked about today, we have a lot of resources on our website, as I've said. Um, so lots of tools available for towns and cities and campuses that are interested in pollinator protection, as well as for folks looking to learn what to do best in their yards. Um, so I, I realize I may have run a little bit longer than I expected, but I am happy to take your questions. Awesome. Thank you, Emily. That was a great and information packed talk. I, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll just, we'll devote maybe like 10, uh, nine to 10 minutes for questions. We'll just go a, like a little bit over the eight o'clock hour. Um, all right, we have a number that have come in. I think you kind of addressed one of them about drift, but I, I think a few different people asked about um, mosquito treatments on lawns and the extent to which that's posing a risk for pollinators. And um, uh, again, the, the drift question I think is um, on people's minds. Yeah, uh, the mosquito control is one that um, you know is near and dear to my, my heart because I understand how difficult it is to live in a place with lots of mosquitoes and have them around you and try to enjoy your outdoor space. Um, but the mosquito control, you know, the barrier treatments, the, the yard treatments that are used for mosquitoes are also 
generally speaking, quite toxic to pollinators as well. So typically what is being used for mosquito management in backyards is permethrin or lambda cyhalothrin, they're both pyrethroid insecticides, which are, um, they will often be marketed as um, derived from chrysanthemum flowers, which is actually the organic counterpart to the pyrethroids. So the pyrethroids are a synthetic cousin um, that are more toxic and more persistent. Um, and the, the difficulty with those is once you've treated um, your backyard for the mosquitoes, wherever the source of the mosquito habitat is in the surrounding landscape, those mosquitoes are gonna just come right back in. So you have treated, you know, um, your backyards uh, and, and, and affected, you know, left residues there for whatever pollinator plants you have in your backyards, but the mosquito problem will, will most likely reemerge if, if they aren't managed at sort of the more, the larger community scale and the source habitat um, isn't dealt with. So I guess what I'm trying to say is the best way to manage mosquitoes is at the community level and not so much in a, a backyard space. Um, so we do have resources available um, on how to sort of approach your community to build a, an ecological mosquito management plan um, for towns and communities um, if you're interested in that. But, um, and if you have other mosquito management questions, I actually would probably give you the contact information for a couple other folks on my team who work on that um, more specifically. Great, yes, I did. a number of people asked about that, so thank you. I think the a related question was just um, whether some of the, I think marketed as organic um, uh, controls for mosquitoes that are also applied to lawns to the, the degree to which those are a problem for pollinators. I think like clove oil is one of them and maybe cedar oil. Yeah, so the, there's a lot less known about the, the effects of those types of essential oil products on pollinators. Um, there, there may be some level of toxicity, but more likely it's actually a repellent effect. Um, so you think about the kind of smell, the aroma, the aromatic compounds of essential oils, those tend to also be just kind of repellent to pollinators. Um, you know, one, one option for mosquito management that is less, um, less toxic to pollinators is actually, I mentioned BT, um, but there is a, there's a BT strain that is, is uh, specific to uh, diptera to mosquitoes that can be used as a dunk, um, you know, in standing water. So if you have, you know, um, water collection off of your roof, you can put a BT dunk in there. It's unlikely to um, affect pollinators, um, but it, it would be, you know, um, something that would be toxic to mosquitoes that are trying to breed in that standing water. So that that's an option that would be um, more protective of pollinators. Excellent. Thank you. I see some folks are asking about resources. I will just, I will relay those questions to Emily and then we can, in a follow-up email, I can um, point you to, or Emily can point you to some of the uh, specific resources that you're asking for from the Xerces site. Um, another one that came up was about, and this comes up a lot, <laughs> is um, glyphosate and Roundup. Um, so, you know, does it pose a risk for pollinators? Um, and the other question is when we're controlling weeds, is there, is there something else that we can use that isn't that? Isn't that? <laughs> Great question. Um, so glyphosate is the most widely used and therefore the most widely studied herbicide um, for pollinators and also for its impacts on other wildlife. Um, and what, I, what we know about glyphosate toxicity to pollinators is that when they are exposed to it, um, you know, potentially from, um, you know, feeding on the nectar and pollen of a plant that has recently been treated with glyphosate, that would be the sort of window of concern, um, that it can affect their um, gut flora. So it basically strips the biofilm out of their guts and changes the bacterial composition of their guts, um, which then can make them more susceptible to pathogen infection. So this is what something we know from lab studies on honeybees. Um, and so what does that mean in the real world? I think, you know, the real window for concern with glyphosate and for other systemic herbicides is in the time period between when it's used on a plant. So let's say it's used on multiflora rows because you're, you're doing invasive management or something and, and that plant is blooming um, and the pollinators come in and for the couple of windows before that plant sort of senesces or dies back, 
they're collecting glyphosate or, you know, or another systemic herbicide. So that is the window for concern for pollinators. Um, so one of the things that you can do is to try and manage weeds outside of their flowering periods. So don't apply glyphosate to a flowering plant. Don't apply um, uh, many other systemic herbicides to flowering plants. But if you can, um, you know, apply it outside of the time period where a pollinator would be exposed to the herbicide, then you have reduced the risk um, to pollinators from its use. Excellent. Thank you for answering that. Um, another question that came up was about, and I, I don't know if you have an answer to this, but the, um, the you know, jumping worms are a, a garden pest right now that folks are concerned about. I don't know that there's a management strategy that has been devised for those. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer for you on jumping worms. <laughs> yeah, I know that I know they're coming up from the south, um, and they're they're probably going to be eating our leaf litter soon. But I don't know that we have uh, a management strategy for them. Yeah, I know it's a shame. I think, um, and then uh, just the last question I think I'll ask, and then I will um, respect everyone's time and um, and end the meeting is about you know you you talked about obviously integrated pest management. Uh, a number, many companies sort of um, brand themselves as, as, as practicing IPM. I guess my question is, is there an, uh, is there an accountability system to know that, that, that companies like truly are practicing you know, integrated pest management or is it one of these terms that has become a little bit at risk of um, you know, being kind of a, a cover for practices? Yeah, there? great question. Um, so IPM, a lot of people, whether it's a, a farmer or a, a pest control company will say that they're practicing IPM, but um, really that just means to, uh, in my experience, in a lot of agricultural areas, it means more things like rotating crop, uh, rotating chemistries of, um, of pesticide products to maintain, um, you know, good control of their insect pests. Um, and not at all what we're what we're using it for, which is a paradigm that's based around prevention and prevention first. Um, so if you're you know running into a pest control land care company that says they're using IPM, I would ask them you know what preventive non chemical strategies are they using to um, to manage pests, um, and I would ask them too you know what sort of thresholds are you using before you intervene for different um, pests that, that you're encountering? Is it like one bug and you spray? Or are you using a threshold that actually allows for some level of, of damage before you intervene? Um, and we actually just came out with a whole um, nursery campaign. So trying to minimize harm to pollinators from the you know, unintended consequences of having pesticides on nursery plants. So that Be Safe Nursery Plant campaign is on our website now. And those resources, which I can I can share with with um, folks who are interested, have questions to ask that would also be you know relevant to land care companies too. Like what what sort of pollinator friendly pest management practices are you using? And it can give you some examples to work with to ask them questions about that. That's excellent. Uh, yeah, I feel like the more we ask those questions too, the more um, it will be communicated that folks are you know demanding those kinds of practices and services. So. Yeah, good, consumer good power is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's why we have more native plants showing up in our nurseries in the first place. Consumer power is how we make change. Exactly. <laughs> um, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for uh, this talk and for answering questions. I do know that folks asked some other ones and I, I promise I will collect them from the chat and I will relay them to Emily and in a follow-up email, we'll provide some answers to those. All right, so thank you everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Great. Thank you so much. I will try to respond to some of the questions I missed in, in my follow-up. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone.